Modulation is a shift from one key to another in a piece of music, and there are many ways to do this. Many modulations occur between closely related keys, that is, keys that either share the same key signature or differ by only one accidental. In this video, we'll look at Beethoven's Piano Sonata, Opus 14, Number 1, Movement 2. It's one of my favorite pieces to illustrate modulation because it contains at least four types of modulation. Phrase modulation, pivot chord modulation, pivot tone modulation, and enharmonic modulation. Not bad for one three and a half minute piano sonata movement. The piece is in the minuet trio form or compound ternary. Even though Beethoven seems to be pushing the tempo a little faster than a typical minuet and seems to be foreshadowing the faster scherzo movements that would become prevalent in his later pieces. Let's take a quick look at the form and find the modulations as we go along. The first large scale section, measure 1 through 42, will label with the uppercase letter A. It's a self-contained section starting in E minor and actually ending in E major. The entire section is, in itself, in A, B, A form. The first A consists of parallel phrases. The first phrase, measure 1 through 8, an antecedent ending with a half cadence on the 5 chord. In the second phrase, an octave higher, a consequent ending on the 1 chord. Let's take a closer look at the first two measures. See the prominent tonic pitch E carried through to measure two in the melody as the harmony progresses from the one chord, E minor, to the six chord, C major? Keep this in mind, as it seems that Beethoven has given us, on a micro level, the main harmonic issue of this piece that will eventually play out on a much larger macro level. Okay, back to the form. At measure 16, the A section ended with a very clear authentic cadence, and new material starts in measure 17. We'll call that a lowercase b section. The motivic material in this b section is very much related to that of the A section, with that same chromatic neighbor tone to the E pitch, but with just a different presentation. And most importantly, the key has shifted rather abruptly to the key of C major. Note the progression 1. 5, 2, 5, 6, 1, in the key of C, here at the beginning, and the cadence to 5, the G chord in measure 24. A few interesting things. The key of C is a closely related key to E minor, only one accidental different. But it is still rather bold to go into this key area rather than move, say, to the relative major, G major. Also see that the modulation is sudden, without a harmonic transition. And this is our first type of modulation, the phrase modulation, perhaps the simplest modulation of all. The composer ends a phrase in one key and then just starts up a new phrase in a new key. By the end of this section, Beethoven is going to modulate back to E minor around measure 30 to 33. Now this modulation is a bit more complicated, so we'll skip it for now and come back to it later. In measure 34, we're back to the lowercase a section in the key of E minor with the same antecedent phrase we saw at the beginning of the piece, but now written one octave higher. You know, the way Beethoven contrasts and balances phrases with changes in registers is rather remarkable throughout this piece. The repeat of this phrase starts in measure 41, but here he makes a strong harmonic gesture toward the four chord, A minor. Perhaps not long enough to be called a modulation, but we could certainly call it a tonicization to A minor. The six chord, C major, in measure 42, serves as a pivot chord between E minor and A minor. In other words, it is a chord that is a common chord to both keys, and this helps to make the transition to the new harmonic area in measure 43 and measure 44 that seems more analyzable in the key of A minor. Thinking in A minor, it's a 4-7 going to a 7-diminished 4-3 before finally arriving 
on the one chord of A minor. By the end of this A section, Beethoven returns to E, but is intent on ending on E major rather than E minor. Notice the G-sharp pitch in measure 51 and the long, cadential extension from measure 51 to measure 60 that keeps reiterating the progression 7 diminished 7 to 1, 7 diminished 7 to 1 in the key of E major. By measure 62, the large-scale A section is complete, and we're ready to move on to the Maggiore, or B section. This middle section begins at measure 63 in the key of C major. Do you remember that harmonic motion of the first two measures of the piece? Well, here it's playing out on a much larger scale, as the key relationship between the two main sections of the piece. We may be tempted to call this a phrase modulation again, as we did in measure 17, but there's much more to it than that in this location. In measure 61, Beethoven completes the section with a very distinctive, widely spaced E major chord at the pianissimo dynamic. Then he asks the impossible of the pianist. Just play that high-pitched E in measure 62 all by itself and make a crescendo. Well, this is pretty ambitious. I'm not exactly sure how we're supposed to do a crescendo on a single pitch on a piano, but we'll do the best we can. Obviously, the pitch E is important to Beethoven at this moment. It's the thread that connects the previous key of E major to the new key of C major. Now this actually is a pretty distant modulation, E major having four sharps and C major having none. In fact, there are no common chords between these two keys that could serve as an unaltered pivot chord. So instead, Beethoven uses a common pitch, the pitch E, as a pivot. Now this is called a pivot tone modulation. The important factor that makes an effective pivot tone modulation is the composer finding a way to highlight and emphasize the pivot note in some significant way. And Beethoven certainly emphasizes it here through texture, register, and dynamics. The maggiore, or uppercase B section, is like a trio section of a minuet trio movement. It actually has its own encapsulated ABA form. A from measure 63 to 78, B from 79 to 88, and back to A for 89 to 100. At measure 100, he marks Allegretto di C e poi la coda, telling the pianist to go back and play from the beginning. Of course, this necessitates a modulation back to E minor, and this is where we get a good standard dominant preparation pivot chord modulation. Here are charts of the chords in the keys of C major and E minor. The common chords between the two keys are the potential pivot chords, C major, E minor, G major, and A minor. Beethoven chooses the chord A minor as his pivot chord to get back to the key of E minor. A good choice because A minor is the four chord in the key of E minor, a chord that has a strong, dominant preparation function in this key. In fact, he introduces the A minor triad in measure 98 as a 6-6 six, six in the key of C, but as a pivot chord, it is the 4-6 in the key of E minor, and it moves directly to the dominant functioning pair 1-6-4 to 5 in measures 99 to 100 to affect this modulation. Let's go back to the first section and pick up that modulation that we skipped earlier. Remember, starting at measure 17, we are in the key of C major. From measure 29 to 32, he modulates back to E minor. Let's see how he does that. In the key of C major, measure 29, it's the one chord. 
In measure 30, he enhances the chord by adding an A sharp, a rather distinctive note. Now, I would argue that when we first hear this pitch, it's really hard to know if we are hearing an A sharp or a B flat. In fact, a B flat would make good harmonic sense here in the key of C. It would help to form a dominant sonority, C, E, G, B flat, which in the key of C we could analyze as the 5, 7, of 4, a secondary dominant chord. But of course, that is not what happens. Instead, Beethoven notates the enharmonic equivalent, A sharp, which resolves up to the B in the next measure. If you recall, this is the voice leading of an augmented six chord, Italian augmented six to be specific. The C pitch in the bass moves down a half step to B, and the A sharp and that tenor moves in the opposite direction, up a half step, also to the pitch B, and the interval between C and A sharp being that of an augmented sixth. And of course, the B that this interval resolves to is the dominant of E minor, the key that we're heading toward. And that complete dominant chord is clearly in focus by measure 31 to 32, B, D sharp, F sharp. So there you have it, an enharmonic modulation. In this case, a note that could have functioned with a different enharmonic identity in the old key, but it's spelled so that it functions more clearly as a modulating agent, taking us to the new key. Augmented six chords are great chords to use for this kind of enharmonic modulation because of their inherent enharmonic spelling as dominant seven chords. So there you have it, four types of modulation in one piece.